it's just well amazing to be here and to share the same indoor air which is different very different experience than sharing the same zoom platform so thank you well indoor air this is the field in i in which i worked for many many years and with many of you here in this room and over the years it's been very often a big frustration that while we were generating well, to what I thought was amazing science and technologies, it was so extremely difficult or impossible to um, influence implementation of this. To the point that um, at one stage I thought, well, if I propose to do uh, research on indoor air quality in future um, dwellings on Mars, it would be far easier to get funding for this and generate excitement about this. And at one stage, which we actually did something to that uh, extent. See these installations at our universities? Now, um, some of you are looking with disbelief. I'm kidding. This is a ventilation system at, our, at one of the buildings at our university. To, the peop to people from outside the field, this, field, uh, this feels amazing. But the reality is that we already have advanced building technologies on Earth to provide indoor air. Yet something is missing. What is missing? In this presentation, well, I'll start uh, and I'll say a little bit about uh, airborne transmission since we are still in the pandemic, despite that we are pretending that the pandemic is gone. Uh, open the window, mitigation of science um, and technologies, vision for the future, whether it's a new and old vision, and uh, something about standards, which ultimately is the most important. Well, uh, for me, the real battle started then, at the end of March 2020, and I all will always remember that, e that last evening of last Saturday of uh, March, when seeing this and talking to uh, colleagues from Italy, which was then the epicenter of cases and deaths, I said something must be done about this. It is not just a misinformation. I didn't realize then to what extent this was really sending the world on a completely wrong course of controlling the pandemic. So as Philo said, uh, that's when it started the next, next day, I drafted a petition and within three days, uh, 35 colleagues joined me and this is how the group of 36 was born. Three days later, we sent this petition to the WHO. Well, it was a very long fight then and with tens of emails daily between uh, the group to, to do something about this. Well, what we were saying was not based on something we speculated, we thought would be the case. This was not the first pandemic or epidemic in the history of hum humanity and even the um, history which, well, we remember, SARS-1, we remember very, very well. What lessons we've um, learned? We've learned many lessons before. To me, SARS-1 was the beginning of research on this field of um, um, particles from respiratory activities. Uh, until that point, uh, uh, the focus of the unit which I established and lead at QUT was, was on particles. But uh, during SARS-1, I got involved well, with this field. And since then, we've done studies on um, what's emitted from human respiratory activities, what are the multi-processes of generation of these particles, which in a simplistic way could be compared to what's happening in this old-fashioned perfume bottle or a nebulizer, but it is far more complex. Uh, but as I said, uh, we and many other colleagues have done a lot of work on this. And that was also the beginning of, for me um, uh, for looking at the bigger picture of airborne transmission. And with my first paper on this topic, Droplet Fate on, uh, in Indoor Environment, little I uh, knew then how controversial the word droplet is. 
to me, a simple physicist droplet is a liquid particle. I didn't realize that in medicine it means something very different. And of course, um, colleagues, other colleagues, um, you in this room have done a lot on this, world, on this uh, field. So the sci science, scientific understanding of the role of the mechanisms of airborne transmission was very well advanced before the pandemic. Of course, during the pandemic, there was an explosion of work on many aspects of airborne transmission. And in particular, this sort of linking, it is, we are talking about inhalation. The key word here is inhalation and inhalation, not just past that magical distance of one meter, 1.5 meter, but inhalation anywhere in the room. Of course, the concentrations are closer to the um, infected person uh, or the person emitting the particles, like to any source, but it's inhalation anywhere in the room. So there was, um, of course, an explosion of science on this virus, but in generally on uh, uh, broader and indoor air. So. WHO well, eventually had to um, give up when after the three months of immense battles, which I guess it's for me never, even, even now sort of hard to imagine how we did it then. Um, this paper was uh, published when they admit they kind of accepted emerging evidence. Well, as I said, the evidence was there, it wasn't emerging. Admitted, but still there was not was not full acceptance of this, and to this day, there is still confusion in the terminology. However, quite a lot of work and effort has been done by the, by the WHO on ventilation. Uh, well, not linking ventilation with airborne transmission was something which was really hindering this process. But anyway, ventilation. So the topic of open the window. If you look at the current uh, messaging from the WHO, like this poster uh, from um, the end of December, uh, good ventilation. Well, what you see in this poster, there are windows, windows everywhere. So that's this focus that the main means for ventilation is open the window. So let's spend a moment on natural ventilation. If there's a window we can open, it's basically natural ventilation. Like in homes, schools, restaurants, everywhere. So if the conditions are right, if it's not too cold, not too hot, not too noisy, not too polluted, all right, windows are open and perhaps there's ventilation, enough ventilation. But in the reality, in most places, more climate, there's something wrong. Either the climate, either the noise, either the pollution. So the windows are closed. And this means that there's no ventilation. So basically, in the reality, natural ventilation means no ventilation. So in other ways, the king is naked. Well, of course, there is a, a little disclaimer when I say no ventilation doesn't mean zero ventilation. Otherwise, we would, well, so, but it is basically no ventilation. So let's move now to places where there is venti ventilation uh, provided by uh, science and technology. Building engineering controls, which we've outlined uh, in our one, well, basically that was our first paper um, of the group of 36, discussing the available options. I'll say a few words, just a few words about uh, sufficient and effective ventilation, but of course that's what uh, Arsen will be talking and also about um, uh, disinfection of the air. So how much ventilation is needed for good indoor air quality? Well, it depends which um, guidelines or standards uh, you look at. Minimum recommended ventilation rates by the WHO at 10 liters per second per person. It is um, a bit different and I guess uh, more complex uh, by uh, ASHRAE. Uh, there's a long big table there and for, uh, for example those two values 9.5 and 4 liters dependently whether it's for a um, um, uh, art class or a hall with um, fixed seats. Why such a big difference? 
because in this art class, uh, pollutants can be generated, so more ventilation is uh, maybe needed. Riva gives the same value as the, uh, as the WHO. So that's all right, but um, there are, well, a few kind of questions here. How will the buildings know um, the number of people inside and what they do? Since we are talking about ventilation per liters per person, well, if the, bill, if the, if the number of people is as designed, um, all right, but the building doesn't know this. The building is not smart. And do we know that this is enough or adequate for controlling uh, uh, infection transmission? So what is sufficient ventilation in relation to uh, infection transmission? Can we use this um, guidelines, standards or any existing uh, uh, information which is so far used? Well, this is a bit more complex because we need to use risk assessment models and tools. Pathogens are very complex beast, beasts. So uh, the most common, commonly used uh, models are based on uh, Wells-Riley uh, equation. And uh, during the pandemic, it was really an explosion of, uh, of these models, which got very sophisticated, very um, uh, um, broad, encompassing all the aspects, with this focus specifically on the quanta emissions, which differs dependently on the virus, on the, on the pathogen, on its va variant. So this has to be taken into account. It's not like with CO2, which we emit, which can be within a reasonably narrow margin calculated for each of us, dependent on what we do. This is very different. All right, this would be a topic for a separate presentation, but um, we can say, all right, so we have a solution. Um, let's choose a model out of this menu available, use the model, calculate the required ventilation for whichever uh, venue we are interested in, set up ventilation, done, right? Well, is it that as easy as this? Not really. Uh, first of all, um, the issue is that every setting is different. So there's no sort of generalization, but every uh, place would need to um, calculate this for the uh, parameters of that venue. So will every school, every shop, every gym and so on do this use uh, risk assessment models and do such calculations? I don't think I need to answer this question. Um, now, but even a bigger problem is that new pathogens variants can come, appear, and they do, and uh, we don't, at the beginning, we don't know the basic parameter, with the which is the quanta emission rate. If we don't know this, well, we can't calculate anything. So, really, um, it's not possible then. But even if this were not the problems, there's another issue. Um, how much ventilation will be actually needed the from the feasibility? point of view. Now, we did um, a little assessment of this uh, with colleagues. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, to talk about the details of this uh, modeling and work, but uh, the starting point is that we calculated predictive quanta emission rates. That's, that's what I mean, uh, mentioned a, a moment ago for a range of different pathogens. And this was at the time when uh, there was still the wild variant of um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, which you can see is the uh, now is this the light? Uh, where can I see this? SARS-CoV-2 is here. Now, um, things have changed, and um, what's not in the paper, because the paper was published when we uh, calculated it for Delta, it was here, which means number one. Omicron is even more. So, all right, so we did this uh, calculations, um, and uh, based on the available uh, uh, knowledge, and based on this, we've calculated um, and what came up to be the limits of ventilation in airborne tr uh, risk transmission. So for this four pathogens, we've uh, established that even high ventilation and high ventilation in the case of this assessment was uh, 14 liters per second per person, which is a lot, much higher than any of the documents I mentioned about, is not enough to 
keep the event reproduction number bet uh, below one. So if we can't provide this, how far we can go with ventilation? Of course, this would become not feasible. And this is not something new. It may sound like an amazing discovery that's not possible, but it was that paper by, uh, by uh, Ed Nardell in 1991, where he already calculated the limits, the theoretical limits to ventilation. We knew that it's only as far as we can go. So what, we, uh, what can we do to control risks of pathogens as infectious as this, or in situations, in fact, where we can't provide enough ventilation. Well, disinfect the air, but in a way that no additional pollution is generated indoors. During this pandemic, I've heard about amazing number of different technologies. You can spray all kinds of things into the air, according to the manufacturers, which would do miraculous things to anything um, alive or infectious in the air, but they don't say what it does to to, to the air and when we inhale this air. So really, the only option which is feasible and which we've known since, since 1930s and which is used in many places in the world now is using um, a GUV, germicidal UV disinfection, low energy required requirement, which is extremely uh, important, does not ger generate anything silent, robust. So, um, and now, uh, something which hasn't been used until that recently, it is the different wavelengths. So it's not something new, different, it's just a different wa la uh, wavelength of far UV 222, which is even much safer because it doesn't penetrate the skin. So it, this could be doing to the air what we already do to the water we drink. Every drop of the water we drink is disinfected. But one point here is that it's not that it's somewhere there in the, uh, in the ventilation system, but it is in the room where it happened. There's a title of a Broadway musical. So um, there's little evidence that SARS-CoV-2 uh, and similar um, pathogens um, transmit through the ventilation ducts which is different, it's not all pathogens, some, some of them, in particular um, um, tuberculosis or fungal spores can do this. So basically the infection occurs in the room uh, and therefore treatment in the, um, uh, in the ducts doesn't really help much, but use, uses a lot of energy. So really the treatment of the air should be in the, in the room. So this brings me to the last point, enforceable indoor air quality standards. Now, management of air quality in general, if we think about this. WHO develops air quality guidelines and most countries have outdoor air quality standards. Just think about how many air quality monitoring stations government operated are in Rotterdam in the Netherlands around the world. Uh, but most countries do not have indoor air quality standards. And even if those which claim they have, they are not enforceable. So really, indoor air quality is a regulatory no man's land, as is. Now, there's a long list of factors contributing to this situation of the difficulties of and progress in managing indoor air quality. So the political, social, legislative um, problems and uh, typical issues, which I'm not going to go point by point, but one of the basic issues is that there's no single national government authority responsible for indoor air. So it should be the Department of Health which should tell that this is a health problem and what should be the limits. But then different area is different, uh, managed by different government departments, let's say Department of Education, schools and so on and so on. How easy it is to get the government department working together. And another problem is the issue that there are no performance standards, but just design standards, um, and so on. As I said, I won't go through all of this list, but where this list is coming from, that's for me. This is from a presentation I gave at a conference, in the rare conference, in, um, uh, well, 22 years ago. Has anything changed with this 22 years ago? That's how frustrating it is. So, 
But there's one other problem in all of this. If we wanted to introduce have standards now, it is the issue of informants and, uh, and monitoring. We've done with colleagues this review of the uh, options available for uh, monitoring uh, uh, using sensors of indoor air quality. And we then co uh, concluded that uh, in relation to uh, the, the, the awareness is a big issue, which of course is um, and lack of appropriate regulations. But there is still the issue of monitoring and we can't just say this doesn't issue exist. Outdoor we monitor at least the six WHO classical pollutants. We cannot have in every room uh, technologically sensors for these six pollutants. Just technologically we are not ready for, the, for this yet. But we are going. The sensor technologies have developed over the last few years, last let's say 20 years, amazingly. So we will need to set to have a subset of the sensors and these sensors would have to be in every room. So the vision for the future, which we've outlined in our science paper last year, paradigm shift to combat indoor infection. So building ventilation systems must get better. But um, this is in that paper, we stated it's not just about respiratory infection transmission. We really need to look at all risk. We cannot try to solve one, solve one problem because this may create only more problems in other areas. Mitigations of all risks, well, we've talked here about um, uh, infection transmission, but there's pollutants which come in from outside, other pollutants uh, which are generated inside. By the way, I will do a private quiz and uh, after the session, anybody who noticed any uh, pollution sources in this venue, I'd like to hear about this. If you don't, towards the end of the conference, I'll tell you what, there's a big pollution source here. Um, thermal comfort, uh, dampness and mold adds. This has to be taken care of the building design, HVAC design, building operation and energy. We cannot afford that buildings consume more energy. So the vision for the future is there will be no naturally ventilated spaces that have no ventilation indoor air quality standards with prescribed concentrations of indoor selected pollutants and be enforceable, monitored in every indoor space. Ventilation as part of HVAC system uh, will be an element to enforce indoor air quality and ventilation in shared spaces will be supplemented by G GUV. So is this vision possible? It is possible and it would be easier to do it here on Earth than on Mars. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>